Well, let's imagine for the moment that it's 49 AD and we get to be a fly on the wall and eavesdrop on the early church. There's been a letter sent to Galatia, to the churches in Galatia, from the Apostle Paul. This is a big deal when you're in a, in a synagogue. They gather together and, and, and the leader stands up and he says, oh, folks, I have this letter from Paul. I'm going to read it to you. I'll reread it to you. I'll reread it to you again. I, I can't make uh, copies. You just have to listen. You'll have to get it as best as you can. So, so here we are. Imagine here we are in this synagogue and we're going to listen to this very letter from the Apostle Paul. And then we're going to go home and sit around the kitchen table and we're going to talk about it. So what did the early church talk about? How did they receive it? What did Paul want to say to them? And, and, and how did they react to that? And that's what we're going to do in this uh, message today. You interested in eavesdropping on the early church, being a fly on the wall? Well, let me begin by asking you uh, two questions. These are the evangelism explosion questions. I used to be a part of a ministry of evangelism Explo explosion. I trained hundreds of people in, in, in how to share the gospel. And what would happen is they would visit church, and then we would call them and ask if they'd like to receive a visit. And, and we go and we chat with them and have uh, some good times together, get to know them a little bit. And then we'd say, you know, we're here to ask you two questions. And you can respond to these questions any way you want. The first question is this. If you were to die tonight, are you certain that you would go to heaven? And there'd be a lot of hemming and hawing on that uh, question. But the second question really drilled down on, on, this, on the issue of how one gets to heaven. And the second question was this. If you were to die tonight and stand before God and he were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say to him? What would you say? And, and I was astonished that, that my guess is that over 80% of the homes that we visited, people had, had these kinds of uh, responses. Um, man, I, I, I don't really know. I, I'm not sure what I would say to God. I, I, I believe in the general notion that God exists and I try to lead a good life and I've been to church from time to time, but I'm really not sure. And what that question does is it gets us to the most misunderstood doctrine and teaching of the Christian faith. And that's what Paul wants to address in this passage to the Galatians. So we have had this dramatic confrontation between Paul and Peter. And Paul calls Peter out publicly over the issue of justification, how one is saved, that, that Peter has been polluted by the work and the teachings of the Judaizers. So he writes to the churches in Galatia and to the synagogue there, and, and then and to the people as they gather in their homes to talk about it. He writes these words in Galatians chapter 2, verse 15. Now, notice how many times he uses this word justification when he writes to them. He, he writes, We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the laws, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. Now, Paul is aware that the Judaizers have been at work on the church in Galatia, and they don't deny Jesus as the Son of God and, and the resurrection, but they want to add to it the oral laws, the ceremonial laws, the dietary laws, and, and specifically circumcision. Every good Jew knows that you have to be circumcised to be saved. So Paul wants to define here our, the nature of our relationship and our standing before God, and he turns to the Roman legal system when he, he wants to do that. And he's answering the question, what is my legal, judicial relationship and standing before a holy God? What is my relationship to the law and the covenant and obedience to all those ceremonial, oral, and dietary laws that the Pharisees have? And to do that, I, I, I want to begin by using a, an analogy of the court system, the Roman court system. Imagine a judge uh, enters the court, uh, we all stand, the judge is seated, everyone uh, is seated. There are arguments made uh, by both sides, and after the arguments, it's the most dramatic moment in a trial when, when the jury returns, and the judge says, have you reached a verdict? And the jury says, we have, Your Honor, and they hand the verdict over to the judge, and, and the judge looks at you and me now in the analogy, I want you and I to be standing in the courtroom of God, and we have pleaded our case of why should we should be allowed into God's kingdom, and a jury has been listening. And they go and they deliberate and they come back and they hand a verdict to the judge. And so the judge opens the verdict and, and he reads, We find the defendant, that would be you and me, guilty 
as charged. Notice how many times Paul uses the word justification. It's a Roman judicial legal term to be declared guilty yet set free on the basis of a payment or the work of another. It's a concept that all of the Roman demands of the law have been met, and the judge declares that all of those demands are fully and legally satisfied, and he declares the guilty to be set free on the basis of the work of another. Now, let's look at the backstory for just a moment. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 23, we find these words. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth, that is Adam, from the Garden of Eden, to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man at the east of the Garden of Eden and placed the cherubim and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. If you'll recall, God created the world and he created human beings, Adam and Eve, and he placed them in this beautiful, wonderful garden, the Garden of Eden. And, and in that garden, there was nothing but beauty and wonder and awe, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, tolerance, fidelity, self-control. It was paradise. But the minute God turned his back, man fell and disobeyed his word. And now we have bitterness and anger and uh, misunderstanding and betrayal and hurt and pain and stress and anxiety. And the cherubim are, are there in front of the garden and, and they're not allowing man back in. Adam and Eve back into that garden because in that garden is the central issue. It's the tree of, of life, the tree of life. There were two trees there, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And up to this point, God had not allowed Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of life, that is to live everlasting life, to live eternally. He, he wanted to put them to the test and they failed the test miserably. They want to be God. They disobeyed God. They betrayed God. And the minute God turned his back, they took and ate of the forbidden fruit. So God cast them out. Now, uh, what's happening here is that Adam is at a functioning as what we call our federal representative head. He is our legal representative for the whole human race. What happens to him will happen to all of his offspring, to you and to me. If he wins, we win. If he fails, we fail. And, and even though uh, that happened long before I was born, I am held accountable for his choices, his actions, and his failure. It, it's what we call the concept of original sin. It is a one-time breaking of God's word. I stand in the presence of God as a fallen human being because my first representative, Adam, failed the test. And he imputed his guilt or his sinfulness and death to me and all of his descendants throughout history. We find in the Old Testament covenant the concept of blessings and curses. You do this and you shall surely live, and you do this and you shall surely die. And, and Adam had received that covenant of blessing and curse, that berith. Do this and you shall live, do that and you shall die. And all of your descendants with you. You are the federal representative, the legal head, the father of the entire human race. And you stand in covenant with me. And there is an imputation that takes place. I want you to grasp that word imputation. That one person stands in the place of another as their representative. Now, once this concept of imputation takes place, there is what we call a double condemnation. Double. There's two problems. The first is what we call original sin. It is a one-time act of breaking God's word, of his covenant, of his standards for us. It's an actual sin. It is personal. It is moral. And it is ongoing to all of Adam's descendants. It's a double problem. Externally, we lost our internal inheritance and were forbidden to enter back into the garden. But there's a double condemnation here. Not only do we fail on the part of Adam as our representative, but we fail on our own part as well. Once we're born, our first words are me, mine, no way, and right now, and I'm in charge here, buster. This is my room. I didn't have to spend one ounce of my time and energy teaching my kids how to be bad, ever. I had to spend all of my time teaching them how to be good because we're born into a fallen world and we're born into a world in which we tend to be selfish and self-centered in our lives and don't want to go in the direction of God. It's the concept of total depravity. I'm not as bad as I could be, but, but I'm stained in all the areas of my life. It's a total pollution. It, it, it's like this. If I had a glass of clear water here and I dropped a black marble into it, that would be the problem, the failure. And we could reach in and take that marble out and the glass would be clean again. 
But that's not what we learn in the concept of total depravity. Total depravity says it's not just one problem, but we're stained and polluted in all the areas of our lives. It would be like taking uh, an eyedropper and dropping drops of black India, uh, India ink into that glass. It would stain all areas of the water. That all of it would be polluted. It would be very difficult to get that pollution out again. So what we say is that we're stained in every area. It's total. Every area of our lives is polluted by fallenness and sin. We, we say that externally, our actions have failed God. We failed to keep God's law. And internally, if that were not enough, if we were keeping the law outwardly, internally, our motivation to do good would have to be in the fullest sense of the word. It would require not only an outward conformity, but it would require proceeding from a heart of goodness, from a pure heart. Our internal motivation and, and desires to do good would have to be perfect. When Jesus was asked one day, what is the standard to get into heaven? He said in Matthew 5, 48, be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Who should we compare ourselves with? What is the standard? It's God. Now, this creates a big problem because God is perfect. Well, what is the simple definition of the word perfection? It's the law of God. It's 100% conformity to the Ten Commandments all the time, in every place, and in every way, and not only externally, but in the motivations of my internal heart. And Jesus said, if you want the cliff notes of that, I can tell you, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind, all of the time. All of the time. And, and, and if that were not enough, he adds in the kicker, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, we all know we can't love God the way Jesus described it there in that great commandment, and, and we certainly don't love our neighbors as ourselves. What is the standard Jesus is saying? It's not each other. It's God. It's perfection. Nowhere in the Bible do we find God talking about being good. But everywhere in the Bible, we find God talking about being righteous being perfect, falling in after his ways all of the time, in every place, every situation, not only externally, but in our hearts as well. That's why Paul comes to the conclusion in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, there are none who are righteous, no, not one. And in Romans 3, 23, he writes, for all have sinned, all fall short of the glory of God. Did you notice that word all? That's you and me. We've got a big moral problem. We failed to meet God's standards for living. There are a lot of good people in this world, but there are none who are righteous. There is no goodness in the fullest sense of the word. The heart is never capable of that ultimate act of good. And so the ultimate question of all of history is how do fallen human beings who fail to keep God's standards enter back into the garden and enter into a perfect relationship with him? Because God, by definition, is holy. He is perfect. And if that which is holy comes in contact with that which is unperfect and unholy, that would stain and taint the very nature and character of who God is. So how do we get to be righteous enough to enter back into a relationship with God and get back into the Garden of Eden where God created us to live in the first place. Now it's at this point that God makes an amazing provision. There's another Adam. There is a second Adam. There is a second chance. He writes in Romans 5, 19, these words, For just as through the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 21, he writes, For since death came through a man, that is Adam, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man, that is Jesus. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45, we read these words, It is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man, Jesus, a life-giving spirit. The good news is that there's a second chance. There's a second representative. And if he wins, we win. And if he wins, uh, guilt is forgiveness and my inheritance is restored and I get to go back into the Garden of Eden where I belonged in the first place. In the first Adam, we have an imputation of guilt and death. In the second Adam, we have an imputation of forgiveness and eternal life. It's what we call the concept of a substitutionary atonement. In the Old Testament, 
they had the day of Yom Kippur, which celebrates the day of atonement when, when Israel was freed from bondage by the power of God. The imagery is very, very powerful because on that day of atonement, the, the Israelites would bring a dove or a goat or a lamb before the priest. And the priest would take his hand and he would lay it upon the forehead of that goat or that lamb. And he would pray a prayer transferring or imputing the guilt of the people who were bringing the sacrifice to the sacrifice itself. It's a very, very strong imagery here of an innocent, spotless lamb receiving the guilt of those who are guilty and who have done the sinning. A, a guilt and a sin is transferred and given to someone or something else. We find this concept of imputation all over the Old Testament and the New Testament. Most of us are familiar with John 3.16. They say it's the most famous verse in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But let me give you a little backstory, a little prequel to that. In John 3, 14 and 15, often overlooked verses to really set the stage and the story for John 3, 16. In John 3, 14, we read, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Then John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So what is that backstory? What is the prequel? Well, we read in Numbers 21, verse 8, these words. The Lord said to Moses, make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. And then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. Well, what's taking place here in Numbers that opens the pathway to understand John 3, 14 through 16? Well, the people were in the wilderness wanderings. Uh, Forty years they spent there, and they were tired of wandering around and tired of eating manna and quail. So they went and they complained to Moses. We were better off back there in Egypt. Why did you lead us out here to all this suffering and this pain? And we don't know when it's ever going to end. We don't know when the last day of the journey is going to be. And they complain to Moses, and, and God hears their complaining. And so as they are camped around the tabernacle, the whole nation of Israel in, in a giant circle of tents around the tabernacle, God allows serpents, snakes, to come into the camp and bite the people and paralyze them exactly where they are. And then he tells Moses, you go around the camp and you gather up as much gold as you can possibly find, and you melt it down into an image just like the serpents that bit the people. And then you get in front of the tabernacle and get the tallest pole that you can find and hold it up in the midst of the people of Israel. And anyone who gazes upon that serpent shall be healed. Now, here's the metaphor. Here's the point. Here's the analogy. Here's the sign that he's trying to say that leads into John 3, 14, as Moses lifted up the pole in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. And that is this, that it was their gaze that saved them. It was not anything that they could possibly do. They were paralyzed. They couldn't move. All they could do was look to have faith in that bronze a serpent that was before the people. And anyone who gazed upon it in faith was healed. And, and, and so John says, Jesus was lifted up just like that, and anybody who gazes upon him will be healed of our sins. We, we can't do anything of ourselves. There's nothing we can add to it. There's no oral laws, ceremonial laws, dietary laws, circumcision. We are paralyzed. There is nothing we can do but gaze upon Jesus, on Jesus himself upon the cross. For God did something. He gave what? His only son, the monogenes, he gave his son, that whoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So how are people saved in the Old Testament? The same way as in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, they looked forward to the promise by faith. And in the New Testament, we look backwards to the promise by faith. Paul paints the picture of Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, the Hebrew people. Uh, and he says in Romans uh, chapter 4, verse 3, these words. What does the scripture say about this issue of salvation? It says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. He is freed from the sentence and the condemnation of the law, past, present, and future by faith. 
Abraham is justified the same way Moses was in the same way Paul was, the same way you and I are justified. We are justified by faith alone, just as if I had died. And because of the death of Jesus, and, and that death is imputed to us, a freedom from, from the sin and a cleansing from sin, a, a double imputation, we will never, ever again be judged. We are clothed, as Paul says, I, we are clothed in the cloak of the righteousness of Jesus. I, in this world, I am both a sinner and a saint at the same time, but I'm covered in the cloak of Jesus, so when God sees me, I'm covered in his garment, his robe. And, and that's why it's the life of Jesus that makes his death important, this double imputation. He dies on the cross for that one-time justification, and then he lives a perfect life on the cross, and he can impute that righteousness to us as well. So that not only is my sin imputed to Christ, but by righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus, his righteousness is imputed to me. Uh, that, that's why immediately following Jesus' baptism, he went into the wilderness to be tempted. Matthew writes in chapter 4, verse 1, these words. Then, immediately following his baptism, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Immediately following the baptism, the Holy Spirit leads Jesus in the, into the wilderness. He is our second Adam. He is our representative. If he wins, we win. If he fails, we fail. He is put to the test by the devil himself, a, a test far greater than the test that Adam and Eve faced. He has to live a perfect life externally and internally in his heart as well before his death can mean anything. If I died for you, it wouldn't mean much other than, well, Stu must have really cared for me, but I have nothing to impute to you. I don't have any righteousness to, to impute to you, and I can't fulfill the demands of the law because it's his perfect life, his righteous life, that makes his death significant and it makes it accountable to be paid in full for the debt that we have before God. It, it, when he dies, we are justified. Full demands of the law are met in the courtroom of God. Now, this is all really, really, really great news. See, here, here's how it works. Justification is a one-time event, once and for all, in the courtroom of God, where I'm set free. Payment's been made for my sin. Uh, the sentence has been removed. I get to get back into the garden one day where I originally belonged. I'm born again. It's like my physical birth. Sanctification is the ongoing process of living out my faith in this world. Uh, the pollution is expiated, it, it starts to get cleansed, there's an interchange, and all of this goes on until I die, until I'm ready to see Jesus. And when I die, when I close my eyes in this world, in an instant, I will open them up in the next world, and I will be looking directly into the eyes of Jesus. And he will say, mission accomplished, well done. I, I've been preparing a, a place for you. Uh, I, I hope you like it. You're justified, you're sanctified. Welcome home, good and faithful servant. And that's what Jesus has in mind for every single one of us, a return to the garden. Welcome home, he says. You are justified. You're justified. You're set free. You belong here. I've been preparing a place for you. Welcome home. I'll see you there.